recognize the importance or in the western world which recognize the importance of india and we had a better understanding and the most and the, and, and then good understanding right from the very beginning with france right because it was the first country that came forward and tried to establish a some some form of strategic partnership with us right so france is the first country therefore with which we had a strategic dialogue after our 1998 nuclear tests were conducted and we were being condemned by all the countries in the world well most of the developed countries in the world france came forward and said that we kind of understand why india is doing this because we understand the security compulsions that india is under right because china had already become a nuclear power state and india also had just fought off the chinese in the 1962 war and obviously there were some remnants of chinese threats and that has effectively proven correct today because we've recently seen that china has always been an irredentist or an or an expansionary state and it had it had no qualms and troubles crossing into india's borders now the very fact that india also is a nuclear weapon state acts as a very big deterrent and prevents like adventures chinese adventurism into indian territory right so obviously that decision has been proven correct and france was one of the first western countries to stand up with us and say that we understand why india is conducting these nuclear weapon tests and let's cut them some slack right so having said so then i if you remember in yesterday's video on india space missions i had played emphasis on the sri harikota launch site wherein from which isro conducts most of its operations now france only helped us in establishing the sri harikota launch site and france along with their cns which is their space pairing organization they have helped us in the creation of engine develop in, in engine develop and hosting uh, payloads etc right now um, so after the cold war france had decided that its preferred partner in the indian ocean region would be india right so right now you must be thinking that france is in europe and that also in one corner of europe and it has nothing to do with the indian ocean region however that's fairly wrong because france has a lot of interest in the indian ocean region and generally globally across the world i'll probably like a couple of slides down i will be sharing some maps with you which would give you an idea about french foreign territories right now apart from france extending such a support to us and being very understanding of our security compulsions it was also the first p5 country to support india's claim to a permanent seat in the united nations security council right so p5 countries are the permanent countries the countries which have a permanent seat in the united nations security council and the countries that have a veto power right so out of all those countries including russia chaipak uh, france was the first country to say that india also deserves a permanent seat at the united nations security council okay so this was a brief history about india france relations and now let's come to the more important part wherein i see a lot of questions coming which is about the recent developments in the indo french relationship okay so recently india and france have now that they sort of have signed a cooperation agreement between one french company and one indian organization now the idea is to develop cooperation in the fields of quantum computing artificial intelligence and exascale supercomputing so exascale supercomputing is basically supercomputing at a very high level in the sense that 10 raised to the power 18 times of what a normal computer can do so that's basically the, the the sort of technical cooperation that india and france have been looking at and there is this term that is now entered a lot of academic discussions called the fourth industrial revolution right so the, the fourth industrial revolution is basically the industrial revolution that is carried forward by artificial intelligence and it includes things like 5g internet and internet of things so obviously countries across the world have realized that now is the time to reap the benefits of the fourth industrial revolution mission before it is too late and some other countries take advantage of it so now obviously if india has to become a superpower and any country like france which has to let's say sort of retain its status as a large power it all obviously has to do well in the domain of the fourth industrial revolution which is basically artificial intelligence internet of things etc right so therefore india and france are looking at some form of cooperation in that sector now coming to the defense sector we anyways know that india and france have very deep and historic defense ties we've also imported and bought the rafale jets from france which they've expedited and they would be with us shortly now india and france have recently signed this agreement called the mutual logistic support agreement what it basically allows is that it gives both the countries permissions to use each other each other's military bases for authorized purposes primarily for refueling activities for repairs etc right so 
by it, it's very it's obviously beneficial for france because it has interest in the indian ocean region but i think it's more beneficial for india because france has two proper military bases one in the indian ocean region one is in djibouti and the other one is in uae right so it is very important for india to have access to these bases so that india can conduct anti piracy operations and secure its energy supply right because a lot of because india is a country which which imports energy we don't produce energy of our own we don't have crude oil or any other resources so we are dependent on the west asian countries to send crude oil to us and this most of this crude oil comes via the arabians via the and even see in the indian ocean region and obviously we need to have a strong naval presence in that region now one of the ways to have a very strong naval presence is to make sure that indian ships can refuel and can go for repairs to ports which are much closer to the sea lanes as opposed to coming back to the indian shore every time so therefore the french military bases in djibouti and uae will help us to a large extent now in yesterday's video i had obviously talked about it. sorry so in yesterday's video i had already talked about how the french agency cnes is co is cooperating with isro so that i have also mentioned here they are training uh, there is in they are developing programs and bioastronautics for human space flight gaganyaan mission which is scheduled to take place in 2022 right now apart from that india and france also have this joint satellite mission called the trishna mission which is meant for ecosystem stress and water use monitoring which is basically a earth monitoring system installed in a satellite which uses thermal infrared imaging technology that is not important you should know that trishna is basically the joint satellite mission between india and france now in the same way indian railways and french authorities are cooperating and they are trying to work out and uh, develop some form of let's say uh, let's uh, the working models etc to support the railway station development program in india right now we obviously know that there is a lot they need to be done to improve the quality and the standards of railway stations in india and france is really helping us out in that way now apart from that very important thing france is assisting india with setting up a six nuclear a six nuclear reactor power plant in jaitapur ratnagiri district in maharashtra now it has been in the pipeline since 2010 but it's only now that momentum is gaining for it let me tell you the importance and the significance of the jaitapur plant right so we have already and we obviously know that india is a country as because india is a developing country and as and when more people develop they'll have more access to resources they'll have more disposable incomes therefore the energy demand in the indian in in, in india would also shoot up by a large extent now to put things into context we think of the bakra nangal dam as a huge dam right and it is very important for india's energy security now bakra nangal dam's power project production capacity is around 1400 megawatts now the jaitapur plant with all its reactors functioning is supposed to generate around 10000 megawatts of power so it will be the largest nuclear reactor in the world in terms of power output right so france is helping india with the jaitapur a uh, power plant in the ratnagiri district of maharashtra so ratnagiri is basically between bombay and uh, goa now now another testament to the importance that france gives to india is that the as at that when france hosted the 45th g7 summit in 2017 it invited india as a special guest to be a part of this summit now g7 is basically a group of the largest economies in the world excluding china right which obviously now there is, there is no formal understanding for the g7 summit there are no legally binding agreements but whatever discussions are take place in the g7 summits obviously they go a long way in shaping global economic policy now apart apart from let's say having a lot of bilateral developmental interest between india and france the sort of relationship that india and france have now it has evolved from being a mere bilateral relationship to a regional relationship now that region in focus is, is the indian ocean region right now why is the indian ocean region very important to france because france has overseas territories two big islands which are reunion islands and mayotte these are home to about 10 lakh french citizens and obvious and all it and along with it there is what 30 lakh square kilometers of ec exclusive economic zone so exclusive economic zone is basically that area which extends beyond 200 kilometers from the coastline in every country and only that 
particular country has the right to conduct economic activities like fishing seabed mining etc in that area right so obviously this huge this area is of huge significance now let me show you the french overseas overseas territories globally so this is mainland france now they have french polynesia in the pacific ocean then in the atlantic ocean they have some territories they continue to have french guinea in south america then in the indian ocean region they have the Mayoet Island and the Reunion Islands, along with some or other French islands, right? So this area around these French islands is very important for France, both strategically and economically as well. And that is the precise reason why India and France are focusing on the Indian Ocean region, because obviously the Indian Ocean region is also of great importance to India. Now we'll also be studying about India-Australia relationship a little later, and it is fairly clear from this map that the Indian Ocean region is also very important to australia right so this is this this is a map that you should keep in mind the, these are the french territories that exist in the indian ocean region and that is the reason why india and france have bilateral uh, naval exercises also in the indian ocean region to protect each other's interests okay now apart from that coming back to space cooperation india and france also plan to launch 8 to 10 satellites as a part of a constellation to monitor and surveil the Indian Ocean region for the region for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Now, apart from that, there is this term that you should be aware of called the International Solar Alliance. So, right after the Paris Summit uh, co co Conference of Parties in 2015, when the Paris Agreement was signed, uh, India and France had come up with this concept of International Solar Alliance. Right. So, basically, it's a collection of around 300 countries. Uh, it's a collection of countries that lie between both the tropics which which receive adequate sunshine so it is a step that india and france want to take and they want to encourage the world and and let's say show some sort of leadership in a in a clean energy initiative of sorts right so india and france are also cooperating in the international solar alliance um initiative so these as i mentioned are the french overseas territories so this is pretty much it guys with regards to india and france so i have tried to give you a brief if historical let's say sort of understanding of indo-french relationship and also try to focus on the specific contemporary issues that are happening between india and france now similarly i'd like to look at india australia relationship following a similar breakup of the slides right so in each let's look first at the brief history of india australia relationships now a very interesting thing about india australia relationships is that uh, india and australia had established diplomatic relations even before india got independent right so the consulate general of in general of india was opened as a trade office in sydney in 1941 now india australia relationships have steadily grown however in 1998 as i told you when india had conducted its nuclear weapon test obviously most of the countries in the world condemned india and obviously australia also <laughs> was one of the first countries to condemn india's actions <coughs> so obviously when a country condemns action like these of the relationship is bound to deteriorate however most countries after the 1998 tests have realized that india is a responsible nation and india is a model for a nuclear power right india is a responsible nuclear power it's not a country like pakistan or a country like south or north korea which though it possesses significant nuclear power they don't it, it doesn't threat anyone and india obviously has a written no first use doctrine that india has maintained that it will never use nuclear weapons in as a as a as, a, as an option for a first strike india's nuclear weapons are only for a retaliatory strike and these are only meant to be a defensive weapon that india has and the main aim of india's nuclear arsenal is deterrence and not first strike capability right so obviously in 1998 nobody trusted india there were very few countries just like france which trusted india but over the years, India has become a very responsible international player and therefore it has started gaining respect. So in 2014, Australia recognized this and signed a uranium supply deal with India. Okay, Now this is the first of a kind deal with the country which is a non-signatory to the non-nuclear proliferation treaty so the npt is basically a treaty that was signed in the late 60s now the aim of this treaty is that at that point of time there were some powers that had developed the nuclear weapons and these powers had realized the 
devastating capabilities of a nuclear weapon and they realized that nuclear weapons are a threat to mankind's future so these countries tried to get together and sign a form of nai sign the non proliferation treaty the aim of this treaty would be to ensure that the other countries do not acquire nuclear weapons or if they are having some sort of let's say internal developmental programs for developing nuclear weapons these countries through this non proliferation treaty try to curb that now obviously india and pakistan are not signatories to this treaty china was also not china was a signatory but then it later became a nuclear power and then acceded to the non proliferation treaty so an exception was made for china and right now india is also saying think that you make a similar exception for us let us either you say so india says that either india will become a part of the npt or india says there is no full lock stock and barrel without any conditions or otherwise india says that there is no point of the nuclear non proliferation treaty now if time permits maybe in the next coming days or next coming months i'll probably do a video on all these international treaties because these are also historic events of continued continuing significance which is a direct headline in your clad syllabus okay so now coming back to this uh, uranium supply deal that we had with with australia now the issue is that australia is sure and australia has abundant uranium supply and we are talk and the future and and a lot of countries depend on nuclear power for their future energy demands now india has uranium in very short supply therefore india needs let's say trustable countries which can ensure regular uranium supply so in 2014 in australia has come up with an agreement with india to ensure that there is a regular flow of uranium to india now only if we can have a regular flow of uranium to a country from friendly nations like australia only then can we go forward with our grand plans of jaitapur um nuclear power plants etc because otherwise so the thing is why nuclear energy is very important is that if you look at what is happening in the world today everyone is trying to focus on the use of electric vehicles and how electric vehicles are amazing in the sense that they will reduce pollution etc but what you need to understand is that in india till today 60% of the energy of the of the electricity is produced in thermal power plants now coal is burnt in thermal power plants and that leads to a lot of pollution and 60% of the electricity is generated through that in in that manner right so obviously if you have electric cars then instead of burning petrol or diesel we will still be burning a lot of coal therefore it's very important for us to have some form of alternate green sources sources of energy just like hydroelectricity solar energy therefore india is leading the way in the solar rise and then you also have nuclear energy right <clears throat> now now this is the historical context of the india australia relationship now they have become great relationship right after 2014 when australia has acknowledged that india is a peaceful country and it is not a threat to global uh, stability right? now guys uh, one thing that i think i have not as in i have not specifically mentioned in all of these uh, slides that i'm making is the role of the indian diaspora right so if you look at the number of indians in australia i think there are about 10 lakh indians in australia then similarly there are about 7 lakh indian in the in the kingdom of saudi arabia so indians continue to be a large diaspora in all these countries and obviously one can't ignore the role that the diaspora has but the, the role of the diaspora in those countries to create a positive image for india right so that's something that i haven't mentioned in this video but generally this is one of the factors that you should be aware of that indian diaspora has played a great role in india having great bilateral relationship with other, other countries so now looking at the contemporary events in the india australia relationship in 2019 the australian prime minister released a document and announced the implementation of an india economic strategy 2035 now so they came up with a vision document that was supposed to shape up india australia ties for the next 15 years right so they have basically set and they have a plan vis a vis how to deal with and how to interact with india right so i'm focusing on some minor details of this plan because it will help you to understand what is the most important thing and what are the most important sectors of cooperation coordination in the india australia relationship right so this current strategy which is the india economic strategy to to 2035 it is based on three main strategic pillars first obviously is economic ties right both countries conduct a lot of trade and the countries would want to conduct more trade because as of now australia is dependent a lot on chinese trade and obviously australia wants to 
let's say remove the influence of chinese state on its economy and australia also wants to diversify its its interest then the second pillar is obviously geo strategic engagement because indian ocean region and freedom of navigation in the indian ocean region is very important for both countries because a lot a large volume of the trade between those between these two countries and of these of india and australia generally with the world goes through the indian ocean so therefore there is let's say convergence of interest there as well and then you have a cultural thrust on soft power diplomacy so so let me try to explain to you what soft power is soft power is a concept that was given by this academician called joseph nai so basically soft so there are two there are three, two three kinds of power right first is hard military power jiske paas zyada tank aeroplane etc hai that country is powerful so us is the primary example of a hard power then you have economic powers so if you look at countries like japan and china which have such a large role to play in global economy these countries have economic power now the third concept of power is soft power wherein you have cultural influences you have things like hollywood etc so there is this one very famous author who had said that most likely mcdonald's has done more for the united states than the aircraft carrier the united states has built right so soft power is basically cult- culture and the appeal of a country's culture that is accepted by other countries in the world for example if you if you remember this show called i, I think you guys are too young for it but there is this show called kyuki saas bhi kabhi bahuti where you had smriti irani playing one of the central characters now that show was the most popular show in afghanistan and every week every day there used to be like people gathered around in front of tv screen and they used to watch that show so similar is the work that is done by hollywood movies so you see movies like avengers etc which are hollywood movies are watched across the world and they help to develop some form of a composite culture and similarly you have bollywood movies that are telecast in the indian subcontinent and in africa etc so these soft power instruments basically increase the appeal that one country has right so india and australia want to work on the cultural thrust and they also want to work on this soft power diplomacy see so this is the concept of soft power that you should understand now this particular report has identified 10 important sectors wherein australia thinks that it can benefit if it engages with india in these sectors now the first and the foremost sector which is the flagship sector is the education sector so australia believes and rightly so that a lot of indians want to go to australia to study and therefore it is a good source of foreign exchange for australia so the flagship sector is education and australia be believes that if there are more collaborations between indian universities and australian universities and australia runs its programs and talks to children most likely your age who are looking at the sort of colleges that they want to go to right so australia thinks that it can benefit a lot out of it and obviously india will also benefit because india has no dearth of skill manpower and basically this skill and india aims to be the provider of the skill of provide india aims to provide skilled manpower to the world for the next 20 30 years right so this would help both the countries then you have three other important sectors which are the three lead sectors which are fairly important as well these are agri business resources and tourism now obviously australia also has a significant advantage here because a lot of let's say indian tourist also visit australia a lot of australian tourists also visit india right and and in and in resources obviously because there are indian companies that have started mining operation in australia similarly india wants to import uranium which is a very important resource that australia has so they want some partnership in this sector as well and then you have six other small promising sectors like energy health financial services infrastructure sports science and innovation so this is broadly the plan that australia has and these are the sectors that it would like to engage with engage with okay india on um, so this happened in 2019 and later on India has recently hosted the East Asia Summit conference on maritime security cooperation in Chennai. So this is not the first time that such a co- conference on maritime security has been hosted. It has been done three other times all the times in India. Now why maritime security cooperation is important because obviously India and Australia have very similar interest in the freedom of movement etc in the Indian Ocean region because both the countries conduct a significant volume of trade through the Indian Ocean region. 
then similarly you had the sixth indian ocean dialogue which was held in delhi recently in 2019 now the indian ocean dialogue is a flagship event of this multilateral forum called the indian ocean rim association now the indian ocean rim association is basically a partnership or a collection of 22 countries and nine dialogue partners right now the indian ocean rim association obviously the most important thing connecting these countries is the indian ocean and the economic resources and cooperation that can benefit them in the indian ocean region so these countries talk about a diverse set of issues going from fisheries management blue economy so blue economy is basically economy centered around the ocean and the resources that the ocean have to provide then women's economic empowerment maritime safety and security etc right so the iora indian ocean rim association is a very important um, organization let me show you a map which gives you a members of the indian ocean and dream association so these are countries that have a very important say and a stake in the indian ocean region so yeah south africa mozambique tanzania kenya madagascar mauritius australia indonesia seychelles and comoros i think most of you will find out for the first time today that comoros is also a country in the african of the african continent right then you have yemen oman uae iran etc obviously pakistan is not a part of it because india was not very keen on in, in including pakistan here right uh then apart from this important organization which is the indian ocean rim association we also have a very important and a security dialogue known as the quad which is the quadrilateral security dialogue okay uh now it was held at the foreign ministers level for the first time last year at on the side of the un general assembly level so before this before 2019 this quad dialogue used to be taken as an issue used to be held at the secretary or a joint secretary level and it's only now that its importance has increased and an assertive and a belligerent china is the direct reason for the establishment and the increase in importance of the quad alliance okay so quad is as of now it's an informal sort of strategic dialogue between four important countries usa japan australia and india so all of these countries obviously have one focus very openly that is to contain the rise of china because a uh, and because an expansion in china basically means that the indian ocean region and the indo pacific region will become very unstable which is not good for any country so this was started in 2007 at the behest of the prime minister of japan shin so abe but over the time people countries did not focus too much on it because china was also not let's say in a way not showing so much of belligerence and it was biding its time but obviously in the wake of recent events in the wake of recent chinese expansionism i think i'll make a video on chinese expansion expansionism as well because just like it has troubled india it has also been troubling other countries especially in the south china sea region so therefore the quad alliance is a direct challenge to china chinese belligerent side right? so the stated aim of the quad is to promote free and open indo pacific so basically they want to ensure that the trade and movement of ships etc and overflight all over the oceans remain free from the control of any specific country right so india and australia are committed to working together to enhance maritime they want to work together on maritime cooperation and since 2015 the australian and the indian navies have been conducting this bilateral naval exercise called oz index now another very interesting thing is that there is a biannual naval exercise called the malabar exercise which is conducted by the navies of usa japan and india and india has now invited australia as well to be a part of the malabar exercise because india and all these countries believe that that they don't have adversarial interests against each other there is no foreseeable future wherein there could be let's say hostilities between india and usa india and australia or japan and in india and therefore they want to cooperate and sort of create like increase the cost for chinese mis misadventures and escalation right so these countries want to coordinate together because military investment is not the first priority for at least three of these countries because there are a lot of other things that these countries want to spend money on at the same time they obviously have to keep up with china therefore these countries coordinate with the us and want to keep a strong hold in the indian ocean region right now recently because so prime minister modi was supposed to visit australia and have a summit with their prime minister but obviously because of coronavirus that could not happen however india and australia recently 
I think in June itself held the first virtual bilateral summit. Now they signed nine important agreements here, but the two most important ones are the first is the comprehensive strategic partnership agreement, and the second one is the mutual logistic support agreement. Now the compre let me explain to you what the comprehensive strategic partnership agreement is. Right, so. Before this agreement, you had a 2009 bilateral strategic partnership agreement, right? So under that, there was the formation of a two plus two dialogue. Now, a two plus two dialogue means that basically, um, at that one time, it meant that foreign secretaries and defense secretaries of both the countries countries would meet and therefore discuss matters of importance. Now, since it has become a comprehensive strategic uh, partnership the importance given to this two plus two dialogue has increased and the joint secretaries now have been replaced by the foreign ministers and the for and the defense ministers of both these countries right? because these are two areas in which they would like to enhance cooperate their cooperation now then the mutual logistic support agreement is basically an agreement that has been signed between australia and india allowing both the countries' armies to access each other's military bases. Primarily, it allows both the countries' navies to dock into each other's shipyards and uh, conduct repairs, refueling, etc. Right. So it is similar to the sort of agreement that we had signed with France. Recently, we also signed this agreement with Australia because obviously both the countries want to patrol the Indian Ocean region, and it's easier for them to have refueling rights or maintenance rights, etc., in each other's shipyards. Now, apart from that, both the countries are also currently discussing a package or an agreement called the Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement. Now, as of now, we don't have a bilateral free trade agreement, but this is a step in that direction. And once the Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement is fulfilled and it's properly negotiated, we'll have greater market accesses to each other's goods and services. And this will obviously mutually benefit both the countries. And if this works perfectly we can at a later date maybe work towards a free trade agreement or more than a free trade agreement we could use as a effort towards a sepa or a comprehensive economic package and agreement right so we could look in that direction and i think a step has been taken in that direction um so this is pretty much it that i had to talk to you about the india australia relationships now i'd like to quickly focus on a couple of countries in west asia with which relationships are very important and have been in the news recently so the first one is between india and iran so i am not going to go into the history of india and iran relations they are like not that important in vis-a-vis -vis what is happening between india and iran right now so in 2016 india had signed a historic deal with iran and they had said that you have this port in which is called the chahabar port and India said that, okay, we will help you develop this Chahabar port. Along with this, the Indian railways also entered into an MOU with the Iranian Railway Authority. And they said that apart from developing the Chahabar port, we will also help you to develop this railway, railway line. Okay, So this railway line was supposed to extend from the Chahabar port to this city in Iran called Zahedan. And then it would go from Zahedan to this uh, city called Zaranj across the border into Afghanistan. So this was a trilateral agreement apart from the bilateral agreement to develop the Chahabar port. But this was this all of this happened in 2016. But I think a couple of days ago, news came out that Iran has decided to go ahead with the construction of the port and of the rail link on its own because it says that um, there are problems with India in the sense that India is not making payments and India has not started construction of the port and the railway line. So Iran says that we will go ahead with it on our own. Now this is in the backdrop of China signing, effectively signing, almost at the verge of signing a 24, five year agreement for a $400 billion strategic partnership with Iran, right? So it gives Iran a lot of flexing room and it gives it the money that Iran really needs to carry out infrastructure reforms. Now why India and Iran relationships have been deteriorating is because India and US have become very close off late and US has Im imposed sanctions on Iran after the failure of the JCPOA. I'll ex basically the Iran's US nuclear deal. In future videos, I'll try to explain to you what is the Iran nuclear, uh, sorry, Iran US nuclear deal and why the US pulled out of it and is it, it is imposing sanctions on Iran. So basically in this backdrop, Iran has said that 
India is not funding, and India is also at fault because India is not able to find companies and people to start working because they believe that if they supply material, manpower, money, etc., to the Chahabar port and this rail line, then their countries and the companies might attract U.S. sanctions, and they obviously have a lot of other businesses, and this is not their sole business, right? So this is the primary issue that's happening here. Now let me try to show you a map which will give you the importance of the Chahabar port and this railway line that we're talking about, right? So this is the Chahabar port in Iran. China is constructing a port 80 kilometers from here, uh, from Iran in Pakistan. This is called the Gwadar port, right? So as of now, India, if it wants to access Central Asia, it has to go through Pakistan. If it wants to access Afghanistan, it has to go through Pakistan and obviously India does not want to rely on Pakistan to trade with Afghanistan and Central Asian countries. So India was thinking that it will develop the Chahabar port and then they'll have a rail line to Zaranj in, in, in Afghanistan which would then which would then be linked with this place called Dalaram. So India has made a 600 crore rupee investment and India has already constructed this road called the Zaranj Dalaram Highway, the Dalaram Highway. And as of now the plan was to link the Chahabar port with Iran so that India could directly export or send its goods to Iran and then from Iran it could send the goods to Afghanistan bypassing Pakistan. Now in Afghanistan also there is this Garland Road which connects all the important cities of Afghanistan. Therefore India's exports to Afghanistan would have increased manifold. Now however with these Chinese investments and with Iran saying no to India and going ahead on its own, obviously this whole plan is definitely challenged. Um, so another interesting thing that I want to talk to you about, and I'm talking about India and Iran, it also ties or ties into India and Central Asia. Probably we'll have a video on India's relationship with Central Asia as well later. So basically, this part of the project that we looked at, it is a part of a larger 7,200 kilometers multimodal north-south transportation transport corridor called the INSTC. Now Iran, Russia, and India in 2000, which is about 20 years ago, had conceptualized this idea of the INSTC because they thought that the INSTC can reduce the time and the cost of transport by a cool 30 to 40 percent. Now, this is what the INSTC is, right? So, as of now, let's say India has to send something to western parts of Russia or India has to send something to the Scandinavian countries. The only route that India has right now is the standard sea route. However, if the INSTC STC is complete, then India can send goods to the Chabar airport. And from Chabar port, they want to have this multimodal transport network. So you'll have highways, you'll have rail lakes, then you'll have probably like ships in the lake regions, etc. This will link to Moscow and then to St. Petersburg and then to Europe, right? So if this transport network is completed, it will lead to a reduction in transport times and transport costs, which would obviously then be beneficial to India because then the ex cost of export would become cheap, which would automatically mean that Indian exports to Europe would become more competitive, right? So this was the idea behind INSTC and let's look, let's see what happens in the next couple of years and let's look at let, that will determine the future of the INSTC, right? So another country in West Asia that I want to focus on is India and Oman, okay? Now, many of you might not know that India and Oman or have had very, very friendly relationships. Relations. Let me show you where Oman is. Now, this is India and this is Oman, right? So there is geographical proximity and the relationship between India and Oman go back thousands of years. So a lot of Indians have been visiting Oman, a lot of Omanis have come to India and this used to be a very important trade route in the ancient past. So the basis of India-Oman relationship is in this very old agreement for, it's called the 1953 India-Oman Treaty of Friendship, Navigation and Commerce, right? So obviously, both the countries are linked with each other. They have a shared history, etc. And also, there's a significant role that is played by the Indian diaspora in Oman because a lot of doctors, engineers, etc., which have basically developed that country and created that country from the ground up have been Indians, right? Um, so... Because of this important relationship, India and Oman have bilateral agreements in almost every field. So there's no point in giving you the details of all these agreements. But let's look at, let me try to contextualize to you the importance of India for Oman, right? So for Oman, India is the third largest after UAE and China source for its imports. Okay, so Oman imports the maximum things to UAE, China, and then India. 
then india is also the third largest market for its non oil export right so a lot of things that are there in oman are imported from india and a lot of goods that are produced in oman are sent to india therefore india basically keeps their economy running now when it comes to oil india was the second largest importer obviously after china from oman and therefore if india is very important to oman because the money that oman runs on is basically provided by india okay now in terms of defense also there is a very close agree uh, relationship between india and oman so the indian small arms system rifles or insas rifles which are used by in the indian army are also the rifles that are used by the omanese army so the oman army of oman and the indian army use the same assault rifle well which basically goes on to say the sort of close relations they have with each other because oman does not produce these rifles on their own and these rifles are produced by the ordnance factory board in india so oman basically trusts india enough to make sure that the mainstay of their armies the their infantry comes from india and they have no qualms about it right now apart from that india and oman have regular tri services exercises their air forces have this exercises called eastern bridge 5 then armies have al naga and the navies have Have Nasim Al Bahar. Now, recently, why India and Oman relationships have become important in the geostrategic domain is because India has gotten strategic access to this port called Dukam Port for military use. Now, Dukam Port is basically located here. Okay, this is where Dukam Port is located, and it. So, let now try to visualize what India has been doing. It has access to Djibouti Port, France's Djibouti Port here. Then it has an access to the Dukam Port here. Then India wants to have access. Access to Chhabar Port here, right? So because this is a very important area for energy, India's energy security. India is trying to build naval bases here, and therefore Oman is very important for India, right? And as I told you, obviously the Akam Port is then very closely located to the Chhabar Port. Now the future of the Chhabar Port is to be seen. What will happen? What will really happen? Even though in 2019 India and Iran had said that we will look at expediting the construction and functioning of the Chhabar Port, but let's see what the future holds. Now the last country, I think we have time. I will take like a couple of two three minutes. The last country that I want to talk to you about in West Asia is Saudi Arabia. Now in 2006, India and Saudi Arabia had a partnership agreement called the new delhi declaration but the most important step in the partnership between india and saudi arabia is the riyadh declaration of 2010 okay now india is very important for saudi arabia because india saudi arabia so saudi arabia is very important for india because saudi arabia is india's second largest supplier of crude oil so you should remember that the largest supplier of crude oil for india is iraq and the second highest second largest supplier of crude oil for india is saudi arabia now saudi arabia has also a major role in india strategic petroleum reserves right so the idea of strategic petroleum reserves came out after the 1973 oil crisis in the world where in countries realized that obviously oil like the flow of oil and the import port of oil is not guaranteed therefore you need to have strategic petroleum reserves in the sense that the countries need to store a lot of crude oil so that in terms of war etc let's say there is a global conflict that breaks out or there's a pandemic like covid 19 and the sea lanes of communication are not open nobody is trading so countries don't obviously want to run out of energy so therefore they are creating strategic petroleum reserves now as of now india has three very large petroleum reserves two of them in karnataka now saudi arabia is now saying that we also want to participate with india in the creation of another petroleum reserve in karnataka in the padur area so padur already has one strategic petroleum reserve and saudi arabia is saying that it will help india to develop another strategic petroleum reserve in the padur area in karnataka now saudi arabia is also very very interested in in creating the large world's largest green field green field means new project like site from the scratch so saudi arabia wants to create the world's large Largest greenfield refinery in Maharashtra in Raigad. So the Saudi Arabian company Aramco is in talks with Indian with the United Arab Emirates and Indian public sector oil companies. Right now, another very important thing that India and Saudi Arabia have recently started doing is that they have found they have founded a India Saudi Strategic Partnership Council. So recently, Prime Minister Modi went to Saudi Arabia to attend. One second. Uh, yeah so recently prime minister modi had gone to saudi arabia to attend um, i'm forgetting the name it's basically called davos in the desert i think i'll mention it in the next slide to you so we went to attend a forum 
right and there in india and saudi arabia announced a strategic partnership council the idea was to have a council which will coordinate on strategically important issues and it was decided that under the aegis of this council prime minister leaders from both the countries would meet every two years right now this is very important because india is only the fourth country which with saudi arabia has formed such a strategic partnership the other three are uk france and china okay so this um strategic partnership council will have two parallel track first will focus on policy political security economic cultural issues etc and the second one would focus on economic economy and in investment now during prime minister modi's visit there were 12 mous which are also signed these focused on like uh, defense industries air services renewable energy medicine production etc one of the very interesting things that happened is that saudi arabia allowed the functioning of the rupee cards in saudi arabia now you must be thinking what is the relevance of rupee cards in saudi arabia basically every year billions of indians go for the hajj right so hajj is this holy trip that muslims take so a lot of muslims from india go to saudi arabia for hajj and now it becomes very easy and on most of these muslims are senior citizens right because they generally go to hajj towards the end of their life cycles so now it becomes very easy for them to go to saudi arabia and use the rupee cards that they already have so the hassles of going there and getting a money conversion card etc those are now removed for the senior citizens now saudi arabia has also identified india as one of the kingdoms eight important strategic partners in its vision 2030 right this vision 2030 is basically the idea that saudi arabia needs to remove its dependence on oil and it wants to diversify its economy so as of now when oil is the most important research and the last 50, 30 40 years saudi arabia has made a lot of money but they have also realized that the future is in clean energy and obviously oil a is a limited resource and b because of the threat of climate change more and more countries and corporations wants to want to get away from oil production etc so it's not such a lucrative business 30 40 years down the line so now these countries are trying to divest their uh, resources and in light of this pm modi has we had visited riyadh to attend this event called the future investment initiative which is known as the davos in desert so this name comes after the world economic forum which is held in davos switzerland where in countries meet to discuss the economic future of the world similarly a similar event is organized in saudi arabia and because of the immense amount of money that saudi arabia has and the potential for investment right so saudi arabia over the years has collected immense amounts of petro dollars and now saudi arabia has immense amounts of money that it wants to invest in other countries now india is the prime candidate because in india needs a lot of foreign investment because there is a lot of infrastructure development infrastructure investments etc that have to be made in india and our government really doesn't have that kind of money so that sort of money would come in the form of foreign investment from saudi arabia and, and therefore it makes saudi arabia a very important country for uh, for india so this is pretty much it that i have to talk to you about in this video maybe we will make a couple, some other video wherein we'll discuss the remaining countries in west asia so thank you so much for listening thank you so much sir for this wonderful session and uh, so the kids let's uh, meet tomorrow at 4 pm for a session on law as a career i will be uh, there live with you along with uh, ramanuj mukherjee sir who is the ceo okay. of law seco so see you tomorrow okay and sure. tomorrow also there is a mock test released by clark consortium so remember that too